Okay, welcome to the last session of this afternoon. Um, the one thing I've learned today is that Apple is actually in the business of selling adapters. <laughs> 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 okay, we've got Dale Hamby here. Um, he's, a passion, he's passionate about product development and the various agile methodologies that enables a team to perform at its peak. Um, he's a co-founder of Noma Nini, a payments platform that allows informal merchants across Africa to provide essential services like airtime, electricity, and banking services to the rural community. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. Um, thanks for joining me this afternoon. I realize that I'm the last person of the day, and it's been an incredible day. So um, hope you got a bit of energy. Um, I'm going to dial it up to 10 to try to keep us awake until the beers. We live on a continent where about 55% of the population, or half a billion people, live off less than 15 rand per day, without reliable access to water, electricity, and telecommunications. What my company has done is building a payments platform that allows us to democratize access to essential services, uh, airtime, electricity, prepaid water, uh, and various banking services. Uh, we've developed a platform, we started in 2011, um, building our own hardware. So up on the top left there, we've got um, one of our original terminals, uh, no screen or anything, um, just some buttons and out comes a piece of paper with an um, uh, airtime pin on it or a meter token for your um, electricity meter. Um, we developed another one um, with uh, a, a screen and now more recently we're moving on to Android, but I'll chat about that a bit later. Uh, we run entirely on Google Cloud Platform, initially on App Engine, and now more lately on uh, Kubernetes. Uh, we've got big front end to allow um, our operators to see what's going on with the different merchants in different areas and uh, optimizing the platform, and then a bunch of integrations into all the mobile uh, telecommunication providers and ESCOM and banks and various things like that. Uh, when we started in 2011, the predominant way of getting scratch cards or airtime into rural communities was through a scratch card. Uh, and this was super expensive because if you got a box of scratch cards, they needed to be transported out to rural areas, um, and then their merchants would buy them, uh, sell them to their uh, community, often at a higher markup than what you could get them in uh, more urban areas. And then that money would have to be trucked back to distribution centers. So people who were the poorest living in the most rural areas were paying the most for, for telecommunications. Um, and one of the, the ways that we came up to uh, solving this problem was to deliver these products wirelessly. And that's why we started building our um, point of sale terminals. Um, here are some of our street vendors from Mozambique. Um, these guys stand at uh, taxi ranks. They're running through, um, as people stop at the red traffic light, they're busy selling um, airtime or selling electricity. Um, and so that we needed to make something that was fast and robust uh, for the African environment. And at that time, anyway, Android was really expensive. So that's why we started with our um, own hardware. And we developed that from the ground up. And it was pretty successful. But over the years, the cost of Android phones has radically come down. When we started, it was about $250 for a smartphone. Um, and on top of that, most of our community didn't really, they'd never used a touch screen before. So the level of training to get people to understand um, the, the basics of operating a phone was, was very challenging. And we could develop our own hardware um, at a, a price lower than we could buy phones. Um, but as the penetration mobile uh, networks has increased, the phones have followed that, and the price has radically dropped to a point now, um, and it happened about in 2016, where we, we couldn't justify building our own hardware anymore. And that's when we shifted to, to Android, um, at least for our point-of-sale systems. On top of that, um, at the time, 2016, uh, Mozambican economy, I'm not sure if there's any Mozambicans in the room, but their economy tanked. Uh, and one of our biggest um, companies that we worked with there went bankrupt, almost taking us with them. So we lost overnight almost 80% of our transaction volume. Uh, went from thousands of merchants down to only a few hundred in that area. Um, and that was well, largely because of like macroeconomic um, things. It's like nothing to do with us. but. Um, it 
was a forcing mechanism for us to rethink our platform. Not only should we switch from hardware to, to Android, but also how do we build our platform? Um, and that's when we decided to, to switch to, to building a phone. So it's a very similar interface to the, the previous one. It's just some the mobile networks, and you press the buttons, and out comes a piece of paper from a Bluetooth printer. Um, and we equip stores um, like this guy um, in Zambia, um, who uh, is one of our more successful operators. But because of this push, um, having designed our own hardware and running all on App Engine, we we were very tightly coupled. We had this, built this big monolith over like eight, five years or so, and we didn't really know how we were going to change that monolith that was tightly coupled into our own hardware that we did, uh, you know, everything from the circuit board design and the firmware all the way up to the Linux operating system and linked to our back end. How are we going to decouple everything and move that to um, being able to support a, what's effectively an unsecured device, um, a phone, and then also how do we integrate not only to mobile networks but into banks so we can so people can start doing banking transactions um, the mobile networks have been encroaching into banking territory uh, especially in Kenya where there's uh, Mpesa has got uh, or run by Safaricom they've got about 80 or 90 percent market share and that's an incredible platform for them to to launch mobile money and that's been one of the most successful mobile money rollouts in Africa um, to such an extent that they're recreating that in other countries and the banks are waking up and thinking, how are they going to compete with something that has got such a wide penetration when they've got bricks and mortar stores and ATMs? They can't afford to set up a bank branch in um, a rural area. They can't really afford to service an ATM. But what they can do is provide a point of sale terminal, um, a little phone, a Bluetooth printer to a merchant in that area um, and that person can not only sell uh, airtime electricity, but they can also do deposits, uh, withdrawals, um, service payments, pay your tax, pay your car license fees, all at this little spaza shop uh, in the village. But for us to achieve that, we had to start splitting out um, our platform. Um, so in long and short, this was <laughs> kind of... You know, we had a monolith that was just a huge pile of poo, and the, the going consensus was, well, you kind of divide that up into smaller piles, and then on top of that, you've got the communication overhead. Um, so that's what it felt like, and, and sometimes I still feel like that's the way. Um, but in summary, um, the monolith that we had anyway, and I'm sure um, it's similar to a lot of how other monoliths kind of started um, or, or turned into. We had uh, a view layer, which was at that stage an Angular app, although we did have a server-side rendered um, Flask application um, for rendering uh, HTML pages as well for our dashboards. Uh, we had a whole bunch of business logic that lived inside of um, just one huge application, and then we had a database. And the teams were relatively siloed, and uh, it was quite difficult when we wanted to do feature development to, um, you know, the technology, the features were typically cross-cutting the entire platform. Um, and trying to get those different teams to talk to each other and to schedule the work was, was a challenge. Um, but monoliths do have some pros and some cons. Um, the pro for us, at least at the start, was the simplicity. Um, it was really easy to start building this monolith from scratch. Um, we could reason about it, and it grew over time. Um, it was also a consistency of the data. Uh, it was just um, a, it's basically a single-threaded application. We did eventually scale it out, but it was really easy to understand state. And, and when we wrote to the database, we knew that that was going to happen. Um, and with big refactors, you, know, you could refactor the entire code base and do one commit, and that was then, or I suppose multiple commits, but anyway, it was like you could do one rollout and know that everything was consistent. Um, but when we, we had a number of developers, and on the con side, a number of developers, because it was one code base, and, and we always tried to do um, trunk-based development as well so t for our continuous um, integration, continuous delivery pipeline, keep that going, we did end up st uh, stepping on each other's toes. Um, it was a single language. Um, everything was in Python 2.7, um, the language that had been moved over. App Engine hadn't yet got support for Python 3 yet. Um, so we were kind of locked into this language, and it wasn't always um, 
we couldn't do what we needed to do sometimes because of the language and the library support that that App Engine had. Um, we did uh, package the entire project, um, even if there was a small change on like fixing a spelling mistake or something on the, the front end. We had to package up the whole uh, application and ship it off uh, into production. So that that process was a little bit cumbersome, um, and. We those consequently those VMs that we were running, or at least the App Engine instances that we were running, were pretty beefy. We had to over provision because some aspects of the the platform needed a lot of memory or a lot of CPU power to say run reports. Um, but the vast majority of the requests were like the CPU and um, memory was pretty much not being used. Um, so then. Having a look at microservices, and just a recap of the microservice architecture, um, there's the business logic layer, um, and in, on f in front of that, an API that allows you to talk, or other services to talk to that service, um, and to expose the business logic um, in a consistent way. And those APIs, um, we took a very much a, a contract or API first approach to designing our services. Um, where the API was as stable as possible, and we had stuff like JSON schema to validate incoming and outgoing requests to make sure that it, con it's, it um, conformed to, to our, our API specification. And then the business logic was pretty much just inside that. Um, each um, instance of the service, we've tried to keep stateless, um, and all the state is managed in the database. Um, and then having a full stack team. So I mean, our teams are pretty small. You know, we've got between six and nine developers um, over the last, I don't know what it is, eight years or so. Um, so we're able to have feature teams that focus on specific um, services and then uh, f focus entirely on the, the feature development across that service. They also have some pros and cons. The pros definitely is a scale out. Um, that scaling out the service, especially if it has been stateless, is, is pretty easy. It's allowed us to do some incredible experimentation. We, we tried Python 2.7. We have a look at uh, Python 3. Um, we looked at Golang, uh, Node.js, and it's the experimentation that we could do with various database backends as well has been great because it's encapsulated into something that's, um, that we can change out if we need to, if we went down a blind alley. Uh, cognitive load is also a whole lot lighter because you're just reasoning about a relatively small service. Um, and they've got fast independent release cycles. Um, if you make a change and it's on a pretty minor service, you can deploy that into production within a few hours of making that change. Um, and it should not have an impact on anything else. Uh, the cons, though, um, the TCP IP communication is typically over um, the network layer, uh, maybe uh, HTTP, if you're using a REST um, protocol, maybe GraphQL or some sort of RPC, but it's all typically over the network. Whereas in a monolith, everything was just inter-process communication or just calls within the, the software itself. So it's, it's significantly um, slower, um, but when I say significantly from the, the computer's perspective, for us it was, you know, didn't impact latency a whole lot. Um, but it did make debugging a lot more difficult. So having two services talking to each other, um, it's very much asynchronous. If I call out to a service and I don't get a response, did that service not get my request or did I not get the response? So you have to you send it again and you have to deal with things like item potency to make sure that if that the receiving service got the same request twice, doesn't... Um, um, act on it twice, maybe like double credit or double debit someone or make two sales when it shouldn't have. Um, so things like um, messaging, tracing and visibility into the status of a number of services is a definitely a challenge with microservices. Um, dependencies were uh, quite a challenge that we found. Um, you want to do uh, a big refactor across your whole code base, or your, your whole platform. Maybe you forgot about an important concept. Now you need to put that in you have to refactor a whole bunch of services around that. Um, and scheduling that amongst the team, scheduling the rollout, um, it can, if you've got those divisions incorrect, then it's, it is a challenge. 
Um, and then there's, there has, is some duplication of infrastructure. Um, I'll come to it a bit later, but for things like um, Kubernetes, uh, when you're running it, you're, you're running your, um, your service, but it's got maybe a sidecar for the proxy, so you can talk to the database. It might have some monitoring sidecars as well. So those bit of the infrastructure is duplicated amongst every service that you have. If you've got a CI pipeline, um, that for each service needs to be duplicated, even though that service could be pretty simple. You now need to set up and configure a whole pipeline to deliver one service, uh, whereas previously you just had one big pipeline. Um, but for me, um, the monolith and the microservice, uh, the way I've been thinking about it is it's really easy to start with a monolith. Um, you can get off the ground, you can c commit some code, and it's a great way to learn what the system is doing. Um, but as time goes on, the team gets bigger, the product gets bigger, maybe it's doing a whole lot more things. It gets exponentially dif more difficult to add more functionality. Um, whereas with the, uh, the microservices, um, to understand how to structure them, how your product should work, how to set up your testing environments. Um, all of that is an incredibly steep learning curve, um, but it eventually pays off. And uh, for us, I mean, we definitely went up the, 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 monolith, uh, the monolith curve first and then went, e it's a bit hectic, um, and then did a massive refactor. Um, and over the last two years, been pulling out our platform into a bunch of microservices. But that hasn't been without its challenges. Um, but I want to take a step back and think if you guys are thinking about how to build um, microservices, or even if you, you go on that route, um, there's a maturity model that you should keep in mind before you go down that road. Um, I think we all start where everything is just manual. Um, I remember back in the early days when we had the, our embedded system, you know, it would be up to me to like get the C code and compile it and plug in the debug ports and like put the binary onto this thing and then um, run some tests manually. And even once we got some automated tests there, the provisioning of that thing and downloading the firmware to a whole bunch of these devices before we shipped them out was, was a challenge. So um, we, we started automating that stuff. And that's where that next phase comes along um, with continuous integration, at least building the artifacts and having a bunch of automated tests. Um, I feel like a lot of us um, are probably on that journey from going from manual into continuous integration if we don't already have a really nice continuous integration system already set up that runs a test and build the binaries and the artifacts. Um, the next big step is moving into continuous delivery. And I think Martin Fowler defined continuous delivery as being able to uh, have your system or your code in such a state that you could deploy it at any given time. Um, so for us, the rule of thumb is um, it's an engineering responsibility to make sure that the code is a, in a, a releasable state and it's the business or commercial decision of exactly when to release that code. Um, but as long as we can get it to a point where we're not blocking the business, they can decide um, they want to release it um, either today or once communicate with the clients perhaps first in the next week or so before it's released, but we can continue getting that there. So making sure that code is always releasable is continuous delivery. Um, it's great for if you, when you are releasing on a, a cadence of maybe once a week or every day, um, you then getting feedback. Um, there's nothing that says we are delivering to the CEO than code running production. And I see uh, somebody reports a bug and a day or a few hours later, that is now fixed. Um, it's very difficult for anyone who's not a developer to point to the team and saying, why are you guys not delivering? Because there's, there's just this cadence of delivery. And it gets a whole lot of conversations about um, metrics and delivery and that it just reduces all of that. Um, so having a push button deploy, and you know, no one wants to sit and like manually provision stuff, so that's a big part of it. So you don't have to um, have continuous deployment, but it is so up someone's responsibility to push it and then the scripts run and deploy your code into prod. Um, and for that, you need very much need a DevOps culture. Um, you know, you've got the, the developers and the operations team, perhaps they're even the same team working together to get this code out into production reliably. Um, and then, I'm not sure, is anyone actually doing continuous deployment? That's very cool. Um, that's, uh, for me, it's always a bit of a step too far, uh, but that's just the personal. Um, I like to um, 
see when the code is actually going to be deployed to prod. Um, but for that, and I'm sure you guys, I'd like to get some feedback there as well, um, a big prerequisite is monitoring and alerting and being able to, so your code is automatically pushed to production as soon as it's passed all the automated tests, but then there should be tests running in production with your alerting system that tells you if something's gone wrong. And typically that's done through some sort of canary release where you release the, you got the existing system running and you release the, uh, the new version of it and on your load balancer perhaps putting 1% or 10% of your traffic to the new system, monitoring the stats to see if there's significantly different performance or error rate or something in the new version with this is the old and perhaps automatically rolling it back or alerting you um, and maybe if it doesn't, the alerts don't go off, it then scales it up to 100% and eventually tears down the other one. Um, that's, I'm sure, I'm glad that people are doing it. Um, so how do you start? Um, we started with our massive pile of poo and basically got a spade and picked something and shoveled that into a smaller piece. Um, the, but that immediately brings up like, okay, you, you got some code that you, and perhaps it's a service, something that you want to refactor. Uh, now you want to, like, how big a chunk should you bite off? And that's like, how big should microservices be? Um, I think Jeff Bezos said, hey, there's a two pizza team. To me, I'm still not entirely sure how big a two pizza, I could eat a whole pizza myself, so. Um, so <laughs> But you know, it's keeping it as a reasonable number of people on the team. Maybe it's six people, maybe it's eight. Three might be too small, 10 might be too big. Um, a microservice, you should be able to so hold that whole service in your head. Um, bounded contexts, uh, things that live together um, or work or where the data is common should be perhaps together. Um, for us, our authorization, authentication, and our people service is all sort of one big realm because there's a lot of communication in amongst that. Um, but I wouldn't go and put, um, I don't know, like device provisioning into that same service because they way out of each other's context. Um, a, a rule of thumb that we've used as well is being able to rewrite the service in two weeks. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about experimentation. If you can do an experiment and you're only two weeks in and you go, oh, that was a really bad experiment, I'm gonna roll it back, or I'm going to rewrite it based on a more conservative technology, um, it's not a lot of time for a developer to spend rewriting something when it was worthwhile doing that experiment in the first place. Um, 12 people in one service, so that kind of seems like a monolith. Six people in six services. I must be honest, we had six people in 30 services. So I think, yeah, um, that six people, six services, sure. Um, does one thing well. Um, so a good example of that for us is our geolocation service. Uh, we've got it's this tiny little service that's basically just maps out where all our merchants are and, and does some really nice visualizations on it on the view side and then on the incoming is just a stream of, of lo location data. Um, so it does that thing incredibly well. Nothing really needs to talk to it. It just lives in the, the typical little service. Um, as small as possible and no smaller, well, I guess you'll know whether it's too big or too small once you've written it. Um, independently replaceable, deployable, and upgradable, and that's really important. Um, we've had some cases where the service has been too small and we've had to deploy like three things all the time. So if you're finding yourself always with the same th couple of services that they're kind of related and you always have to, there's dependencies and you have to deploy them at the same time, then that probably should be one service, or at least maybe you've made them too small. Um, and some sort of heterogeneous technology. Uh, if you, you've got like MongoDB and you've got some sort of, uh, you know, you've got a, progr one, a different program language and you've got GraphQL and some RPC and maybe a REST interface, so you've got all this technology in one service, that's probably not a microservice anymore. Uh, if your microservice has got using one language and maybe talking to like a single type of database, then, then that's great. Um, so, too big. Um, you'll know your service is too big when it's painful de to deploy. Uh, it's hard to change because of the, all the dependencies. Um, you ask yourself when you, you're going through the code and you're working on what you think is something small over here and it references some other 
code that you've never heard of before, or you've never come across, or maybe you want somebody else to, did months ago. It's like, that's a warning sign, a code smell, that it's possibly too big. Uh, if you've got a large team um, and you're all working on this thing, it's probably too big as well. Um, and if you've got lots of different technologies, you've got RPC, REST, different databases, different code inside this one um, microservice, then it's probably too big. Uh, equally, oh, sorry, um, you can, to fix it, um, the seams, so thinking about your, your business context, your, your domain that you're working in, finding those seams typically along the data lines um, and breaking that up into perhaps two services or, or multiple services. Um, so that's splitting it on dependencies. Um, if your code is, is tightly coupled, um, finding out why and is there a way that you can split it there and maybe have those two uh, things talking to each other um, rather than depending directly on each other. Um, functional decomposition, data partitioning, so looking at your data model, finding out how you can split that. Um, and then um, the last resort is um, adding some sort of API as a wrapper around it um, as a facade um, so maybe, and then having later on, so, you, so you think you've got your, your API layer with, with where you've already split it out, but you've got this big back uh, big mo uh, microservice, um, then you want to split that out, but at least you've got this layer in the time being, and then later on you can go and split it out. Uh, too small, um, you've got integration issues. Um, Lots of coupling um, with deployments, trying to, to get stuff out simultaneously, then those probably is too small. Um, and if it's just basic CRUD services, like if all you're doing is updating a single database table, then your service is probably too, uh, too small. You should rather focus on the business behavior of what the service is supposed to do, rather than just updating a table. Um, once again, to fix it, drawing the dom uh, redrawing the domain boundaries, uh, possibly uh, combining two services or multiple services together, um, hiding the CRUD and putting um, business orientated um, service or at least logic in front of it, so you're adding some value. Um, and as a last resort, some sort of service aggregator. Um, so a good example for us was user registration. Uh, we needed to talk to auth and to people and to various prov other provisioning services. Um, so what we did is we put a registration service, which is completely stateless in front of that, that does uh, all the orchestration amongst all the services. Um, and later on, we, we're re-architecting how we deal with people and authentication and that. Um, if you've got it right, uh, first thing you need to get right is have a, re a reasonably mature DevOps um, culture in your organization um, and no siloed teams. And from there, looking at your business domains, looking at high cohesion, um, so that's um, system internally talking a lot to itself and low coupling, so it's not talking unnecessarily to other services or depending unnecessarily on other services and has a single responsibility. Um, and a large part of that is comes down to organizational culture. Um, how can you... you uh, or it takes a lot of organizational change. If you're at a, a monolith and you've got your, your silo teams that are in, change, um, in charge of a platform like a, the database or the back end or the front end and flipping that 90 degrees so they have a full, um, they're, f they're f focused on releasing features. Um, and something to keep in mind is, is the Conway's law. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So if you have two teams, you're, you're probably going to have like two main pieces of your architecture. If you, and where we came from, we had a highly cross-functional team, but that meant everything spoke to everything, and it's just as bad. Uh, so keep this in mind, that your your architecture is going to be a reflection of your company communication process. Um, so which brings me to cloud platform. I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. Um, but um, there's a continuum of services on Google Cloud. Um, on the one end, 
and I'm not going to talk about it, obviously, but like you can completely run it on premises. You can run your platform on premises, um, and on the other side, you can have uh, things like cloud functions. And in between that, you've got VMs, um, so a Google Compute Engine. Uh, you've got Kubernetes, uh, which then is running your your different services for you. You can move into App Engine, which completely manages the scaling um, and the operations side, um, all the way to uh, cloud functions, very similar to Amazon Lambdas, uh, where you just deploy a piece of code and that runs. Um, and then you've got Firebase for, uh, we've got some application like Android app developers here. Uh, you guys used Firebase before. Um, so it just simplifies a whole lot of, you can write a backend without actually needing to write a backend. Just put some logic there. Um, so you go from really flexible, but you have all the responsibility of managing that, all the way to a prescriptive, very opinionated way of, of building your services, um, but it just works and you're not going to have any downtime. Um, so there's the stack um, with Google Compute Engine at the bottom. Kubernetes is built on top of that, and then App Engine on top of that, and then eventually Cloud Functions right at the very top. Um, so we're going to talk about Compute Engine briefly. And stuff that I find useful in Compute Engine um, is stuff like live migrations. So that's taking a running VM, um, mirroring it onto another physical machine, and then and with almost instantaneously switching state to this new running VM, and that continues to run. So what you perceive on Google Cloud is basically no downtime, even though they've migrated you off of um, different virtual or different physical machines. For us, we've, I've got this one thing that I set up ages ago. Um, I, it gets zero love and attention, and it just runs. Um, and that's been up for 400 and now 30 days. Um, and that's on a cloud provider, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, custom machine types. So um, we got, uh, on Kubernetes, we wanted to, we had a lot of single core machines, and I wanted to, to they were all talking to each other. But in Google Cloud, um, your network bandwidth is proportional to the number of CPUs you have on the machine. So if you have uh, a four core machine, you're going to get four times the bandwidth than you have if you have a one core machine. So having microservices, I wanted them to talk that bandwidth to be as high as possible um, and the latency is low. So increasing the network bandwidth helped by putting more CPUs, but also with the services that just happen to live on the same node, there's much faster communication because it's all just on the local host. Um, but that meant for four core machine, the standard is, um, is uh, 16 gigs or 15 gigs of RAM, but I was able to just make a custom machine type, get that down to um, to 6 gigs, and that was a 17% saving immediately. Um, also, instance resizing recommendations. Uh, Google will watch your services for you and tell you whether you're over or under provisioned, which is pretty cool. Um, price and performance. Uh, you get pre preemptible VMs, which I'll come back to later. But basically, if you can have bursty workloads and Google give you 60 seconds before it will take your VM away from you, um, then you can save 70%. Um, sustained use discounts, so if you just use it for the whole month, you get automatic 30% discount. Uh, committed use discounts, if you commit upfront for a number of minimum number of CPUs and RAM for a year or three years, you get a big discount as well. Per second billing and custom machine types as well. So Kubernetes, Google's been running on um, containers for years and years, um, and everything on Google runs in that, and they launch something like two billion containers a week. Um, but then they took this, this infrastructure called Borg and they, they rethought how they should do this and invented Kubernetes. Um, so in brief, Kubernetes, you've got some code, you take it, you package it inside a Docker container, and that becomes your microservice, right? Um, you might have something like a proxy server that you need to run with your, con with your microservice as well so you can talk to the database. Um, and both of those, those uh, Docker containers are so stored in Google Container Registry. Um, you then configure Kubernetes with a YAML file to say that these two, um, these two Docker containers need to run together and it forms a pod. Um, you have a node, which is a, a VM, a physical or a virtual machine, to uh, checks in with Kubernetes and says, hey, I'm available. Um, and Kubernetes then says, right, this pod is going to go run on that node. Um, and that 
uh, node then starts pulling the what it needs, its dependencies out of container registries. So this is case the microservice and the, the proxy that you want to run. Um, and if you want to run sort of high availability, then you can pull out uh, multiple, uh, so not high availability, if you want to do load balancing or, or um, horizontal sharding, then you can with running it multiple. So if you've got three nodes, typically you might have um, three or four services running. You've got, what's that, five instances of um, uh, service one running, a couple of service two, a couple of three, and one of four. Um, you can run that in a single zone. So you've got uh, computers, got regions, which will be like the east coast or the west coast of the US, and then a zone is typically like one data center in that region. Um, so you'll have a Kubernetes master that's managing um, in one uh, zone for you with a bunch of uh, VMs with a whole lot of services scheduled onto them. You can also run in some sort of high availability mode where you've got two Kubernetes masters running, they're talking to each other, and they're busy watching um, all the, the services to make sure that they're running for you. So if you have a, a zone failure, um, you'll see that uh, these three services got killed um, because that zone went down, um, possibly that node failed, um, so now you've got uh, Kubernetes, the other master will take over, and it will schedule one of the pods onto an available space, but now you can see that there's two um, pods that should be running but that aren't anymore. Um, so you can set up things like uh, preempting and priority, so you can give your services different priorities. Um, so in this case, um, service four has got a lower priority, so it gets killed, um, and then service two will get scheduled onto into its place. Um, obviously, you can now spin up more machines to take these pods that should be running, or hopefully you've got enough availability um, to continue operating even though there's a zone outage. Um, in dev, so our dev cluster, we run um, across three zones um, with pre preemptible VMs. Um, and what that means is that anytime Google can just take away one of your, your VMs and say, like, we well, want to take this back, and then they give it to someone else. But for that privilege of being able to take it back with only a few seconds notice, they give you a 70% cost discount. So for us, we run our whole uh, dev cluster in with this uh, on preemptible VMs. So it's like having a real life chaos monkey that can just like basically take these machines down, and our whole dev system needs to survive that, which gives us a a lot of confidence that when we're running in prod, if it, there should be a big zone outage, that our system will behave correctly. And we found a number of bugs, like uh, we didn't uh, refresh connections to the, the database after a service came up or, or things like that, which now we solved. Um, App Engine is now, you can think of Kubernetes, you've had to manage your nodes, you've had to manage um, your your um, how you're going to schedule a service. Um, App Engine is, um, takes that, that best practices um, and codifies it for you. So it's a little bit more prescriptive of how you should write services, but it's very much based on like industry standard. And if I don't know if you've read this book, Release It by Nygaard, um, it's, I read this when I first started working on App Engine, and there was a lot of hate on the blogs about, ah, Google, you're making me write stuff in this way that is just too difficult. Um, but you read the best practices, um, and you see that they've done it for your own best interest, because that's going to be the way that you scale um, and, and survive outages. Um, so App Engine is just a platform as a service. You've got a bunch of languages that you can run on it. And more recently, you've got uh, stuff like um, Microsoft.net. Um, and you've also you've got your standard environment and your Flex environment. And Flex is just Docker containers that they run for you, basically on a cluster that you don't have to care about. Um, and then above that, you've got or where even less operational support is Cloud Functions. Um, so you've got Cloud Functions, you've got uh, Firebase, uh, cloud functions as well, slightly different branding, but what it is is uh, you can load some node code into, uh, you, on just you write a file, uh, deploy it with a command line, and every time something either you, it gets uh, run when there's pub sub, come, a message comes in, maybe it's an HTTP request, uh, something like that. Um, so should you do a monolith or a microservice? Um, well, for me, the big learning curve has been, um, like there's been these multiple learning curves. The first one, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me, could you give us a few minutes? We're not finished yet. Thank you. 
sorry. <laughs> um, cool, so there have been a bunch of learning curves. Obviously, CI automation first. CD is the next big learning curve that you need to go through. Microservices, understanding what the best practices are there. Um, typically using something like Kubernetes for the control plane. Um, and then above that is improving visibility. And I know that's personally on our journey. We haven't quite got there yet. Istio is a, quite a big learning curve on top of the big learning curve that we've done now with Kubernetes. But it's the best way to look at how do you, you manage your, your visibility, your cross-service tracing, your debug, um, A-B testing on your services or your canary releases, all of that. Um, so the big lessons that we've learned, um, Monolith was increasingly difficult uh, as the team and the product complexity grew, um, so we struggled with that quite a bit. Um, um, microservices, was it's going well, but we started and we were like, ah, I hate this monolith, just chop it, and we went way too small. We had a bunch of CRUD services that now we're consolidating um, again. So we'd probably go from 30 services down to maybe 10 or 12. Um, need a strong CI and CD culture uh, and DevOps culture um, to, so when you, you like that is incul uh, inculcated into your team already. They understand writing automated tests to getting push button deployers working. Um, and even then it was pretty challenging for us to get that right. Um, Refactoring while it's live, uh, it's like changing the engine while the airplane is flying. You know, you want to do a big refactor, you can't just deploy a new version of everything and, it, and shift the traffic. Um, you, have, you do these piecemeal things and there's either you accept that they're going to be lots of deploys simultaneously from everything that's changing, or you've got to build a facade around it so you can um, put the, so you can basically keep the contract the same but inside, behind that changing, um, which means is for a small team, there's a lot of overhead in that specifically. And I'm surprised, or was surprised, by the amount of overhead to manage backward compatibility while you're refactoring. Um, distributed systems are always challenging, uh, and it's an asynchronous nature of network communications. Um, is, there's a lot of event uh, communication, uh, TCP, uh, when you, you send a packet off into the ether, whether it's to the next machine, the same machine, the one across the internet, you don't know whether it's going to get there or not. Um, it will, it guarantees delivery, but not how long it's going to take. Um, and then the ecosystems, like especially Kubernetes on Google Cloud, has been incredible for us. Listen to some war stories from companies like Take A Lot, who built their own Kubernetes cluster, and they really struggled with that, and are now moving over to, to Google Cloud. And I'm very glad that we didn't try and build our own Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we're using something off the shelf like uh, Kubernetes Engine. But it's still a, a big learning curve, and it's taken us probably 18 months to two years to really feel like we're, we're getting into um, where we need to be. Um, but the biggest takeaway for me is you don't actually remove complexity, you just move it from one place to another. Um, and it's accepting the pain that you, that you want. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, if there's questions, please. <laughs> Joss, how much time have we got? Can we, can we take two questions? Awesome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, what's the best way for you to handle authentication between two or more um, microservices? Um, so if you're using something like Istio, uh, you can do mutual TLS authentication between two services. Um, so they each have each other's um, public uh, certificates or public keys, and they have their own private one, and they sign the packets between each other, so it can verify that that communication is definitely coming from who it says it's coming from. Um, we didn't do that. Uh, we used uh, JSON web tokens or JWTs internally. Um, so when a, uh, we have a session on the, we don't use JWTs externally, but when a client comes in, we know that their session is valid, we attach a JWT with their whole context, and then that is passed through our whole call chain. Um, and that's got their, um, their permissions that they're allowed to have on our platform. Um, and sometimes then we wrap that the user's JWT in a service's JWT as well and send that down because not all users are allowed to, it's like say registration, right? Um, a user isn't allowed to, well, when you're not even authenticated on platform, you should still register, but you shouldn't, you should be, re this registration service should be registering, not just anyone. 
Um, so we use JWTs internally, otherwise, but I think a better way would be to use Istio and, and mutual TLS authentication. Uh, one more? Uh, with the very unpredictable nature of a new startup or a product that is yet to be known if it's going to be a success, would you still say that using or not using the monolith approach um, would be viable because of the additional time and development effort? Um, so from all my personal projects and, and small things, I'd still go with monolith, um, especially if it's very early stage. It's like if it's seed funding or something, or it's your first six months. Sure, yeah, monolith is, is the way to go because you you one developer, two or three people can get it up. But if, you've, if you're a team that's already using microservices and for you, you've already got a CI box that's set up with all this thing, you've got lots of experience with Kubernetes, then sure, go with microservices. But um, I personally, I wouldn't start off that way. I would start with a monolith, but being prepared and, and making sure that the business understands that as soon as there's some sort of scale happening, there's gonna be a big rewrite. But there's probably going to be anywhere. Your first version of what you built is, is probably not correct anywhere. Sure. Um, okay, right. thank you, Dale. Thank you. Um, um, I am around and I'll be, I don't know, out of the pool and having some drinks. So if you want to get me, please do. Okay. Thank you, guys.